Today's podcast from the archives comes from our first in-season series in 2017, and this was with Matt Drenkel, who is now at Army as the tight ends coach. He was the head football coach at Kansas Wesley in a place where he did an outstanding job in bringing that program to the top of NAIA. And we talk a little bit about game planning and in-season thoughts. Enjoy. I'm joined today by a repeat performer, head football coach at Kansas Wesleyan, Matt Drinkle. Matt, it's great to have you back on the podcast. Thank you for having me, Keith. Well, Coach, you've kind of had a busy year here. In January, you were at the AFCA. You were selected for 35 under 35, and and you had a talk there. Uh, I know you mentioned that you're going to be heading off to uh, West Point to speak at their clinic. So kind of busy for you this offseason in terms of uh, speaking and presenting. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a really great experience, and I'm not really sure how it all got started. But, uh, you know, once I got in, I've been involved with AFCA with a couple different committees for several years and had the opportunity to speak out there. And, and it was uh, kind of a strange deal where they, they wanted me to talk, but not necessarily really specifics about X's and O's. So uh, my, my talk at, out at the convention was really uh, about, I guess, the, the evolution of the run game and some of the things that are, are trending right now in college football. And, I think it was well received, and since then I've been talking in a lot of different places, and things are going really well. I'm getting to meet a lot of great coaches and talk a lot of great football. That's the best part about uh, our profession is the networking side and, and really the willingness to share and help e- help make each other better and the game better. Yeah, absolutely. It's it, That's the part that I guess when I was young and first got into coaching, I didn't understand of how much it truly is a fraternity and how much everybody really – will go out of their way to help you to to learn new things and, and see things differently and, and teach you. Uh, it's, it's been a great experience. Coach, let's let's uh, revisit that talk that you had at AFCA because I do think some of your points there are um, pretty interesting. And when you're talking about the evolution of the run game, you know, focusing on the components of tempo, space, and simplicity rather than um, personnel group scheme, and the standard huddle kind of were the focus of that talk. Walk us through some of the key points of that. I guess what really got me thinking about it and, and really what drives uh, what we do offensively here, and that's not to say I, I've run the exact same stuff everywhere we go, but, you know, really I was born and raised in old school, you know, 21 personnel, two back, I formation, and that's all I knew forever. And then uh, when I got into college coaching at Western Illinois, that was about the same time Rich Rodriguez was just killing it at West Virginia, and they were totally they were spread and running zone read and all this stuff I'd never even seen or heard of before. I was 22 years old at the time, and uh, I was just like, geez, this looks so much different than everything I've ever seen. And then uh, what really hit me was the 2012 Rose Bowl, where in Oregon with Chip Kelly played uh, Coach Bielema's Wisconsin team. It was their offense was run by Paul Christ at the time. And really, it was just so it was so fascinating to me to watch because you had two teams that ended up in the exact same major bowl game, and they both ran for well over four thousand yards, and ended up in the exact same place, and they got there completely different. You know, Oregon was pretty much you know ten and eleven personnel, uh, not a ton of formations. You know, lived in two by twos and three by ones, and went a million miles an hour, but were able to run the ball really effectively. And then Wisconsin, you saw on the other side of the coin. That was the year they had uh, those three backs that all hit a thousand yards, and they're they're twenty two and and twenty one and twelve and trade shift motion jump atlas go slow huddle. So it was just crazy because it showed you offensively that really you can get to the exact same spot doing completely different things. So that's where I started to think, man, is there any way to unify some of these concepts that people are doing? And I think one of the things that I you know what, that I try to do now, and I guess the the big point of my talk was you see in right now in college football, uh, a couple of trends that are happening with that are regardless of what you run, whether it's uh, option football or it's spread or whatever personnel groups you base out of, you you see a couple of common things, which is really like you hit on. uh, It used to be, you know, you, you line up, you change personnel groups to change formations and, you know, these specific players did these specific things and you'd scheme up a different, a bunch of different ways to run plays. Well, really what's evolved now is that people are utilizing space as a resource the same way they used to use personnel groupings, really. And, and you're seeing tempo. Now, when I talk about tempo, you know, everybody automatically assumes that means just going really fast. But really there's all different. There's 
as far as I can figure it, about seven different kinds of tempo. You know, it's uh, you can be no huddle where you, you know, signal everything, no huddle with wristbands, you know, sugar huddles, quick huddles, standard huddles, uh, the look or glance tempo, whatever those are. But you see people changing tempo now so much more to help you throughout the course of the game and really the simplicity of what they're doing. You, you really, the, the really high octane offenses right now that are putting up a bunch of yards and points and a very efficient running and throwing the ball and don't turn it over. Uh, those guys are all really doing, you know, they, they not very many play concepts, you know, they, they might carry a little bit of variation within it, but they're really, you know, they change their tempo. They're, they're, they're using different spread components to do that. And they're really simplistic in what they do and how they teach it. And I think that those three things are really, uh, and then we talked to, you know, I kind of in the talk or whatever, I, I go through specific examples and exactly how we're doing in, or incorporating some of those things in our offense. You know, one thing that it seems like this, this uh, past season, towards the end of the season, even through this off season, I did have coming back into uh, play a little bit was the idea of, of shifting and motioning. And I think some guys were looking to uh, maybe introduce that back into some of the things that had become a, a little bit static in formation. Have you found any of that um, to be true in your research? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's kind of funny because everything, that's what I think is so cool about what's going on in college football right now. And even in the NFL, I mean, if you watch the Super Bowl, the Eagles are as good at it as anybody at any level. But the, uh, you know, you, so many things happen in trends. You know, you always, I always heard that when I was younger. It's just, you know, everything in coaching and schematically, a lot of it happens in trends or cycles. Mm -hmm. And uh, it kind of comes and goes. And that's what I think is so neat right now is that we're living in one. So right now that there is some really neat things happening that 30 years from now, when people talk about RPOs and packaging things together, like we're doing it right now. And in a couple of years, the defenses are going to continue to evolve to catch up and the offenses are going to have to do that. So I think that certainly you've seen some of those things where you can, you know, the, the motioning, the shifts, there, there's so much like numeric unbalance people are doing right now with formations that's, that really causes a lot of problems. And then the other thing that you're talking about, which is a great point that you brought up, but just the fact that those shifts and trades can happen where you get kind of a hybrid personnel, where there's a guy who's kind of a fullback, who's kind of a slot receiver, who's kind of a tight end, and he can wear a lot of different hats in the offense to where you're really changing personnel groupings by using different formations, right. even though you're not really doing it. And that's when you can see that those, those shifts and motions and things like that you know, really take shape and help people out. And what we do offensively is, I, and I've done it both ways. You know, I've gone slow and, and move, try to move every single play. And I've done that before. I've gone where you go a million miles an hour and you were about 98 snaps a game. And I think when you do one only, that's when you become very easy to defend. Somebody can get into a rhythm against you defensively. So what we try to do is when we, when we start a series, we will go slow. I want to give the defensive coordinator time to cover any adjustments. I want to make sure the defensive kids have time to catch their breath. So if we're going to go slow, though, we're, we're going to move a whole bunch. So I'm going to be on the front end of a series. I'm going to move and try to put as much pressure on, your, on a kid in the game, defensive player in the game. I want to put as much pressure on his brain as I possibly can. And then once we get about our, first, our second first down, or a big play, or I see their star guy go out to catch, a, catch his breath, we'll go a million miles an hour, and then I'm going to put the pressure on your legs and your lungs. So I want to be pressure, I want to stress something physically on a defensive player every single play that we're running, whether it's his brain or his body. Absolutely. That's something I really studied and looked at as well. And I think you know my whole philosophy behind – moving people and I, I like to do a lot of shift and then motion and move multiple people is it has the same effect as lining up and running a play fast in, in my opinion when you do it with pace I mean you can't jog across the formation you really got to move and it's something uh, I, I got the opportunity years ago uh, it was actually during a bye week to go see Boise State play at Toledo and Boise State was operating from a huddle and going from like they would substitute like 12 personnel for 12 personnel and, you know, just kind of drive you crazy with that. But then get out of the huddle, shift motion and run a play in such a fast pace that 
it put a lot of stress on the defense probably just as much as it would if if you were trying to line up and, and run fast from static situations. So I think it's all about, you know, what is what is the objective? Is if the objective is to, you know, make the defense wrong or make them play vanilla, I think both work equally well. And I love that idea of starting a series off like that. I, I I've said for a long time, like as an offensive coordinator, you can't just think about your side of the ball. You have to think about that other side too. You don't want to go three and out in like you know, you know, ninety seconds real time. No, that's exactly right. The other thing that you know where I have to keep, I have to keep telling myself to quit screwing it up. But you're exactly right. Is you you want to score points or you want your side to do well? And, and as a head coach, that's been I guess initially it was hard for me to balance because you want to you take pride in the offense and how it goes and all that stuff. But you look at all the teams that were winning. They have they are heavy defensive emphasis. You know, there's a lot of teams that put up a lot of points, but the teams that are winning championships consistently, they're still very good defensively. And and so to me, like, and that's the other thing, you know, here, our D coordinator is one of my best buddies. So it works out well that I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm getting smarter every game and every year of not, you know, shafting that guy on, <laughs> on tempo and, and turning the ball back over. I would always, um, you know, be sitting up in the press box next to, our defensive coordinator, and we would actually communicate, like, you know, right at the end of the series, like, hey, you know, how, how you guys doing? What do you need? And he'd tell me, like, hey, you know, if you can, slow things down, give us a little time to make an adjustment or whatever. Sometimes you say, hey, you're good, you know, put the pedal down. So that just – that kind of feedback really helps you um, as as a play caller but also helps manage that whole game plan, right? Not just the offensive side of the game plan or defensive side, but the, the game plan to defeat that opponent as well. And I think the other yeah exactly. I think the other thing I found is is going back to the the motion thing. I always looked at it as it's really three opportunities to make the defense wrong because they need to recognize and get that right. They need to communicate and get the communication right, and then finally they need to you know adjust their alignment and get that right. So when you can you know add shifts into things, it, it presents another dynamic to the defense that they have to account for. Yeah, the best way I've ever actually heard that explained was uh, when I used to be the offensive coordinator at St. Ambrose University in Davenport, Iowa. We used to go up every spring when I was there to go watch Wisconsin. And they'd, they'd always do a 10-minute you know, a t- a movement period every day where they did that. And I remember Coach Bielema vividly telling me, because he's a defensive guy, and he was just like, you can make kids make so many decisions in such a short amount of time where just to line up correctly, that's 11 decisions. And then once a motion, a shift happens, that's 11 more decisions. Now you're at 22. Then a motion, now you're at 33 decisions. And when, you know, two or three of them become wrong at some point, that that really creates a lot of advantages for an offense. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, as we talk about that idea of personnel, changing personnel, well, especially at the college level, in some ways becomes a disadvantage because, number one, the official's going to stand over the ball. So if you're a no huddle, if you're a no huddle change personnel team, they're going to sit there and watch you. So you really got to think about when you change personnel, how are you going to affect the defense in that way? Like you said, with, I said three opportunities to be wrong, but you're right. It's 33 opportunities to be wrong. You know, how are you going to do that from a situation when you come out there, put your guys out there, they stand there, the defense takes a look at everything and then the official gets out of the way to let you start running your procedures. I, I couldn't agree with what you're saying more. Like to me, you, you know, you can, you can manipulate officials a little bit during the course of the game. If you do very tempo, because they, they kind of get the intent that if you're, if you are going slower and you're moving and shifting or whatever, they, they keep the, the tempo or the rhythm of the game pretty static. Then once you start going fast, they get that you're trying to go fast and kind of move it that way. Whereas if you go in beforehand and they know you're a, 94, 95 snap game, snap team, they'll, they'll do exactly what you're saying. They'll stand over the ball. They'll wait a long time. And you see that in all levels of football. So I think that then the other piece too, like you said about changing personnel, that is so important right now because th- there has been some rule changes in the last five years that are that you can utilize to help you so much offensively. Different ways to manipulate defenses or certain defenders to where – Man, if you can't, if you don't change personnel offensively, they don't get an opportunity to get kids out of the game. You know, so you can take advantage of 
you know, if a team's got a really good front six, you know, I'll start a lot of series by sprinting out or, or running a, you know, a power read play or something like that to get those kids running sideline to sideline and tire them out. So by the time I gain 20 yards or run four or five snaps or whatever it is, I'm now running against gassed out players and, you know, fatigued players. They, they make all kinds of mental mistakes and miss arm tackles and all kinds of there. So there's just some of those pieces that are so critical that, that have changed recently in football that if you're, in my opinion, if you're not taking advantage of those, you're crazy. Absolutely. I, I, I think the way that I started to, to view it, you know, especially, you know, early, I love to change personnel. I love to get guys involved, build on their skill sets. But when we could get to that situation where we could leave like an 11 or 12 personnel on the field and still do all we wanted to do, we were at an advantage. So I started to look at, you know, when we might change personnel would be after a wave of, of tempo. You know, maybe we start with, you know, like you said, a little a little bit slow shift motion and then put the pedal down and, and go at them for a little bit. And then maybe we do want to get into something else because we're in a different area of the field. Maybe there's different focus, you know, whatever it might be that when we get into a different personnel group, then I would look at what are the tools we can use to get back to that effect of, you know, making them wrong, getting them to be vanilla. And one thing we kind of studied a little bit was uh, something we got from Auburn, their, their little sugar huddle that they would run. But the idea with, you know, putting the huddle right up close to the ball, aligning in a certain way, breaking the, going back to, this is a, man, this is a long time ago. You break the receivers out and the center out first, whatever. But then moving out really fast. So breaking the huddle in, in 3.5 seconds or less, getting the ball snapped. So now you're back to that effect of not, not 100%, but the effect of tempo again, even though you had to huddle. Yeah, they, yeah, that that has been so successful for those guys. It's unbelievable. In fact, I usually in, <laughs> I, the guy who's the offensive coordinator at Northern State right now, Myers Henderson, used to work for me down here, and he, and he he loves that. He thinks that is one of the greatest pieces of of tempo and, and wrinkles you can put in offensively. Whereas I've always been more of a look guy, like look to the side. But that has been so, and you see a lot of teams. Every team that runs that that like that burst huddle or whatever, they are so successful with it because it's so you know you can jump into unbalanced you can hide passing strengths uh to mess with defenses it's just that that has been a huge huge a way to really again hide personnel and sprinkle in different tempo and then especially if you you know you see that so you expect it to go fast but then if you either hard count out of that or look out of that you can you can steal yards and free plays absolutely and and that that's the beauty of, of tempo and changing things, changing the tempo up is there are those opportunities that you're going to get the free play, especially when you think at the high school level, you don't even have to do anything. They're just going to throw the flag and, and march off five. The college level, we got to snap the ball and make sure we snap it before, you know, they get back out of the neutral zone. Yeah, it's actually, you know, it's, it's really fascinating right now that you've really seen a paradigm shift between offense and defense where it used to be offenses would change personnel so much and defense would just kind of stay out there in their whatever, 4-3, cover 4, 4-3, cover 2, whatever it is. And now you're seeing offenses really stay static in their personnel groupings, but defensive are, are, are personneling like crazy. You know, they have their third down package, they have their run-stopping package, and they're changing people mm-hmm. in and out of the game much more now than they ever have before. So whether they want to go back and forth between three-man fronts or four-man fronts or dime packages, whatever it is, but you've really seen that completely flip-flop over the last several years, which I think is really just I, – I just think that concept is really uh, fascinating to look at. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, again, that, that idea of tempo, I think you said you identified seven tempo tools. I, I wrote a book a few years back, an iBook, and it had, had some video in it illustrating it. But we actually, over the, the course of my time at BW, came up with – 20 different procedures. Now, all, all variations, I would bet they kind of fit into those seven families that, that uh, you mentioned there. But, you know, we wouldn't carry those into the game. But what we started to do, honestly, was game plan tempo and even think about our series and upcoming series and how we're going to use tempo as part of the attack as well. Yeah, absolutely. That, I mean, that makes that makes total sense, and especially if you can, like I said, you, if you can grab bag a little bit of this or that, and it fits into your 
you can run it from your personnel groups. You can run it from every formation. You can run it in every situation. You, hey, that's a huge resource for every offense. Coach, I know you guys are, are gearing up here to start spring ball. And, you know, one of the things we mentioned before we got got going is that uh, you're looking at doing some really unique things in, in practice and uh, something that, you know, will help pay dividends moving forward as you uh, learn your offense, install your offense, and then move into fall. Yeah, so we started some of this about, uh, you know, I feel bad because we started this about halfway through the season last year. And uh, some of these, some of these, you know, one of them I'm going to talk about, and everyone who's listening will think I'm absolutely insane. <laughs> so give me a second to justify it. And the other one <clears throat> has been really has been great for us. But I started this about halfway through the season, and the last month of the year we averaged about 55, 56 points a game. And I think I don't even I don't know that we punted once over the last month. And I think some of these changes that we made has really helped the entire system work together. So what we, there was a couple things we did, which is number one was we got rid of uh, offensively. We didn't run a single play versus a scout team once. So here's how I, now I'm not, if I was a, you know, the head coach at Iowa state or Michigan or something like that, I, I wouldn't do it the same way because you have so many good players on your roster across the board. But we re- I really looked at it like this is, you know, we're practicing, so we play well on Saturday. If during the game, we want to execute at a very high level. So we have one of two choices. Either we can line, you know, because the talent level or the talent discrepancy, I guess, at our level, which is, I would imagine, similar everywhere that's not a major BCS school, there's a big drop-off from your ones to your, to your scout team guys. I mean, there's a substantial drop-off. So what we did was, you know, I really justified it like this saying, okay, well, we want to play well during the game. I have two choices. I can either one go against our first team defense and we go good on good. And every play we run, we're going to go against good players. They're going to align correctly, go through keys correctly, run a million miles an hour, defeat blocks, fit runs correctly. Or I can go against a scout team and line them up in what looks like the other team uh, other team's defense, and the second the ball is snapped, they'll do everything wrong. You know, they, they won't fit, you know, other than the uh, before the ball is snapped, they're not going to play the same way that uh, the, 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 like how a game would be. So we really stopped doing that. We talked, it, it really helped you gauge the way that we teach. Um, it's really helped the way that we run our team periods. Um, the quality of football we played, I thought, was so much more effective and efficient, not only during practice, but especially during games. So that was one, that was one major change that we did. And people, I, you know, think I'm crazy, but I, I, don't, I think there was only one week the whole year uh, past week three that we did a single play versus a scout look. The other thing that we did that was really great was we do different scenarios every day. So we, some of those are field zone scenarios. Some of them are down and distance scenarios. But every day that we practice, we simulate different scenarios. And uh, the way we did it this year was I wanted – I had a first-year defensive coordinator. And at the same time, like I think, again, if you were asking your kids to practice because you wanted them to you know, perform well in a game, I think you need to have your coaches do the same thing. And I think that so many coaches script specific looks, but you don't get to do that on game day. You know, you, you get put in all different kinds of scenarios that, sure, you're obviously prepared for, but is there a better way to do it or a more effective way to do it? So what we started doing was take, like, third and short period for us. We would spot the ball. Third and short to us means third and one to three. So what, what one being like a foot to gain all the way out to three yards. Right. So what we would do is we would have to get to the minus 30-yard line. You know, we always come out from our own end zone, so we get a good shot. And what we would do is if we had third and one to three, we would spot the ball having to get to the 30 yard line. So when the play ended, the center would keep the ball. The center had total control over the hash and he had control over the distance to gain. So we would do a 10 minute period of third and short where we don't script a single thing and we have to call it against each other. So third and short might be, you know, we run a you know sweep to the left or inside zone to the left. And we get, you know, we get stopped. Well, the next play might be on the left hash, and the center sets it somewhere one to three yards behind the 30-yard line. 
So I find out the distance to gain, and the defense coordinator finds out the defense, defense or the distance to gain in real time, just like a game. And we do that on third and shorts. We do that in the red zone. We do that on third and longs. All of those scenarios, which have really helped us, because then you're not scripting. You're having to call realistic scenarios. You're having to call exactly how you do in the game. The ball is going to be spotted on the hash where it ended. And you find out all different kinds of tendencies. That One is you become much more effective as a play caller. But two, you find out so many of your own tendencies because you get so much data uh, on more of those scenarios than you normally would. So, for example, if third and short, you might only be in those 2.5 times a game. Right. Well, you might not have a big enough sample size to figure out you know, things you do really well or mistakes that you're making or things you don't do very well. Whereas if you do those in practice, you can call it as opposed to script it. Man, you, maybe you're calling something too much or you're not using it enough. Or uh, So those a couple of those little adjustments have been so advantageous to us. Um, and then really, I just, I don't think we have not heard of other people doing it that way. No, I, I love that idea, coach. And it's something... I really started thinking about, you know, a few years ago, just this idea, whether it's, it's something like that, where you're working on, you know, your, your play calling, your procedures, all those things, or even just the ability to coach, you know, different reps and different drills and see things as a coach, we have limited reps too. So anytime you can find those opportunities, especially something like that, that's going to be important on game day to maximize those. I think it's, it's a great opportunity to learn from. Yeah, you know, like I said, I had a first-year defensive coordinator who was 26 years old. So, you know, if he calls an entire season, he's going to call 900 and, you know, somewhere between 880 and 950 snaps. Whereas I can get him, you know, I can quadruple that in practice if I'm putting him in a scenario where he has to call. You know, and once I started thinking about that, I'm like, why in the hell am I not doing this for myself and getting better? You know, so, you know, it's so easy when you're just like, hey, all right, this plays left hash, this plays middle, this plays right hash, this plays middle, and you get to do everything perfectly. But just some of those tendencies. The other piece where I, I, I knew I needed it really bad was I had never called a game from the field until I became a head coach. And this sounds, this sounds stupid, but it's, it's true, and I'm embarrassed to admit this. But when I had never called from the field. And when for about a year and a half it took me to figure this out, and then I went back and looked. When I get on game day, I used to do this in like 14 and 15, and it's, it was brutal. But on game day, I would call plays towards my sideline over and over and over because I wanted to see what was happening. <laughs> and, and, you know, like, I, I just, I just kind of noticed it one day, and I was like, oh, no. And I went back and looked, and sure, sure enough, every – I mean, it was unbelievable. I would never call things, you know, especially on the perimeter, away from me because I, I felt like I wasn't going to have a good idea of a, a line of sight. So I've had to – you know, you, you find some, some crazy little things like that. And, I, and hopefully there's somebody, like I said, there's somebody listening who also has had that. If you do, you know, <laughs> message me or tweet at me or something so I don't sound, I feel so bad. <laughs> I feel like a, a five-year-old. But, yeah, I used to just – so you just pick up so many of your own little tendencies that hopefully you can catch before somebody else does. Yeah, is that something that you guys intentionally uh, go through and, and... – I don't say run reports, but obviously you can you run run some analytics on practice and the data you're getting from practice. Yeah, absolutely. We we and uh, the other thing too that uh, and I'm just going to say this because I don't know it a lot. I didn't know this, but if anybody, I, most everybody uses huddle. The huddle speed we have found out has almost nothing to do with internet. It is all about the USB port. We have a really good IT guy here, a new guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, the USB port that you plug into runs the speed of which your the film goes from the camera in. So what's awesome for us is that when we get done with practice, and we'll film about 190 snaps per practice probably uh, of, of like actual cut clips that we watch from the night before or from that practice, we can cut a practice, uh, about 190 plays, and by the time I walk from the practice field, and talk to our trainers just to get a quick injury report and then walk downstairs to my office, our film is uploaded and data entered already. And, it, and in like 15 minutes, probably max. So our guys do an incredible job with that because it allows you to sit down and right away. And we're very, very thorough with what we do in practice and how we do it and, and, and getting a feel for how things are happening, you know, what, what's happening in your own systems. But again, that you're doing some stuff you're doing really well and some things you need to improve and some things you just, you're not very good at it for a number of reasons and you need to throw it away completely. 
Coach, uh, we're getting towards the end of our time here, and I know we kind of bounced a little bit from our original agenda. I want to make sure we didn't miss any ideas that we wanted to share with our listeners. Sure. One, you know, the one uh, last thing I wanted to touch on, and I forgot about this when we were talking about motioning and shifting or moving, the other trend that you see happening right now, and we do quite a bit of this, is when you align in the formation and then free release motion one of your backs from the backfield. And I think that that is so critical right now because for two reasons. One is a defense is aligning to a formation that, you're, that they're not going to defend when the ball is snapped. So, for example, if you align in 20 personnel, two backs in the backfield, and then one of them takes off right before the ball is snapped, uh, you know, about a second in, you're really snapping the ball from a 10 personnel formation, but they're defending a two back formation. So it, it, it adjusts. You can really leverage safeties and outside hang players really, really effectively. And the other piece is that if you build some of that stuff in your RPO game or, or your drop back game, it was really easy for the quarterback because if we move one and they adjust with zero, something good just happened for us. Throw that guy the ball. So I, I you, if you look at, you know, Central Florida's and Oklahoma's, those places are doing a lot of that stuff. That is just, it's a very simple thing. It's a really hard thing to combat defensively because even if they start to adjust, now you can automatically displace defenders, you know, and, and follow up by running inside zone or power or something like that or a counter game. So you can go back and forth in kind of a chess match. But, you know, some of those things uh, where you're, again, where you're free releasing backs in the backfield, that is just, a great thing that's happening right now. And I think a, a huge causes huge headaches for defenses. Yeah. That's just some great ideas that you share with us today, coach to uh, both stress a defense as well as get more out of practices. It was great to, uh, to get you on the podcast again and talk about all these different topics. I appreciate what you're doing and uh, best of luck in your uh, presentation, your clinic talk at West Point. Hey, thank you so much again for having me. This is the best podcast there is out there. Thank you so much. Thank you again for listening to the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. Please, if you are enjoying the podcast, head over to iTunes or Spotify and click five-star for a rate. If you have a minute, write a review. It really helps the podcast. Check out our new home for the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. That's at coachandcoordinator.com. And follow me on Twitter at Coach K. Grabowski.